Right. Well, focusing on Dodd-Frank, there were a number of provisions in the legislation uh, that became effective upon the adoption and signing of the legislation by the president that didn't require rulemaking. And I think one of the most important ones, maybe the most significant one, is that the uh, Congress extended to the SEC the power in administrative proceedings involving any violation of the securities laws to impose civil penalties, monetary penalties. Uh, going back to 1990, the courts have had the power to do that. The SEC had the power to do that in a proceeding at the SEC only in cases of discipline of somebody like a broker-dealer or investment advisor who was registered with the SEC, but not for a public company or officers or directors, people like that. Uh, this change now allows the SEC the choice of forum, whether they want to sue in federal court or whether they want to bring an administrative proceeding at the SEC. Uh, and this is rather significant for the defendant or the respondent, as it's called in the administrative proceeding, because that means uh, there's a dis distinction in the procedural requirements. In federal court, uh, they get a lot of discovery, all the parties do. In administrative proceedings, that's very limited. Uh, the rules of evidence apply in federal court. They don't apply strictly in administrative proceedings. Uh, by the rules, administrative proceedings can move very quickly. Federal court civil actions tend to move rather slowly. And lastly, uh, there's a right to a jury trial in federal court if, if penalties are going to be assessed. Uh, defendants might not always want that, but it's available. It's not available in, in an administrative proceeding. So there's a concern on the part of the defense bar that the SEC will use this in a way to fast track and steamroller over parties. One is that uh, the SEC has the power under uh, the Exchange Act, did have before Dodd-Frank, the power to bring a case for aiding and abetting a violation of the Exchange Act. Uh, there were not similar provisions in all of the other federal securities laws. Dodd-Frank did two things with that. One is it provided for aiding and abetting causes of action just for the SEC, not for private parties, uh, for any, under any of the securities laws, and then expanded it. It had previously provided that you could sue somebody for knowingly providing substantial assistance to another wrongdoer. Now the statute provides that, that you can be liable for recklessly or knowingly providing substantial assistance. Now, some courts had held it knowingly encompassed recklessly, and, and that's now been clarified. Uh, but that gives the SEC some broader power, uh, broader reach, and able to reach people who recklessly assisted somebody. Correspondingly, uh, Dodd-Frank also clarified that a provision of the law that makes uh, liable someone who controls somebody who violates the law applicable to SEC enforcement proceedings. That's a provision uh, that had been uh, primarily used in civil actions where you sue one party and then you try to reach those who control that party, perhaps because they have deeper pockets, and, and the law expressly provided that. Now the, SEC, the, the Congress has clarified this, this also applies to SEC proceedings. So they can reach controlling persons and they can reach aiders and abettors. Um, there are a couple of other points that are worth making. Uh, again, it's not clear how they'll how important they'll be, but one that's been uh, issue was controversial for a long time was that if a party in the securities business was found to have violated the law in that business, they could be barred in an administrative proceeding um, from further employment in that in that industry. Uh, but when the SEC said well, we want them barred from the entire securities industry, if they're broker dealer, we want them barred from being an investment advisor. Let's say. Uh, at least one major decision it held, no, you can't do that. The statute says you can bar them from the industry in which they committed the violation, but not from the entire industry. Uh, Dodd-Frank said that you can now uh, impose what are called collateral bars, which means if you violated the law in one aspect of the industry, the securities industry, you could, depending upon meeting the standards of the statute, be barred from the securities business generally. Uh, so that's something that in contested cases in particular, uh, we may see the SEC taking advantage of to try to throw the book at somebody who uh, otherwise could work in some other aspect of the industry. Um, another small issue in that regard, um, again, I'm not sure how significant it'll be, but Dodd-Frank uh, added a provision that said the SEC can proceed against people who were in the industry and violated the law but have since left the industry. So you, don't, uh, you can't escape enforcement 
uh, in the administrative context uh, for violating the law as a member of the industry by quitting and, and leaving your job, leaving the profession. They can still go after you. There are enormous constraints. Um, even before Dodd-Frank, the SEC really uh, was, was limited by its budget. Uh, you hear stories of the SEC uh, directing staff members to pursue cases where they don't have to travel. Now the SEC has offices all over the country, but you still sometimes have to travel. Sometimes you have to travel internationally to take discovery and if you can get it. Uh, and, and that, I think, is a significant constraint. And now with the SEC having uh, had imposed upon it this enormous additional responsibility of both adopting rules for Dodd-Frank, on which we all know they're behind schedule, um, getting slammed by the D.C. Court of Appeals for the proxy access rule for not having done a good enough, thorough enough job when they did adopt that rule, uh, which was authorized by Dodd-Frank, um, and, and the additional enforcement burden that will come with the expanded authority over derivatives, some derivatives, obviously the CFTC has much of that, and the money isn't there. Now there are proposals, as I understand it, to increase their budget somewhat, but not a great deal. So I, I think they're going to, while they still bring a large number of cases and they still settle most of them, which obviously saves them money, uh, I believe that there are significant constraints in terms of them carrying out their, their enforcement authority. Another open question here is whether, uh, how they will handle what might be a significant additional load coming from whistleblower tips, uh, which, they, which they have to decide whether to follow up on or not. And if they get more tips that look like they're more substantive than the ones in the past, that will pose an additional burden. And if they don't follow up a tip, they run another Madoff, risk of another Madoff, where they get egg on their face for not following up something that they were alerted to. So I, I would not like to be in the, in the seat of the SEC chair or the director of enforcement deciding how to allocate my uh, limited resources.